All right, and so last but not least, so I'm not very much looking forward to our final speakers, also going to sum a little bit up what we've been doing for the last week, and so I'm very much looking forward to your talk. So it's Marika Taylor from Southampton, please. So I actually divided this into two. So the first half is my own work, and the second half is a, is a summary, as I was asked to do by um, Johanna. So I'm going to begin by talking about holography at finite radius. So to give a little bit of context about this, of course, you know, the most famous example, which has been explored even 20 years, 21 years after it was written down by Marmosena in this conference, is um, the, the duality between string theory on a background with anti de Sitter asymptotics and a d-dimensional conformal field theory. And essentially, this conference is about generalization of this relation to other classes of gauge theories, other classes of, of gravity with different space-time, um, various kinds of space-time asymptotics. But long before Maldasana wrote down the ADS-CFT conjecture in the early 90s, uh, people like Toft and Susskind formulated holography um, really from black hole physics, from the you know, considerations of entropy, the idea that, that black holes have the maximum entropy that you can get in a given space-time volume. And this, this, the arguments they use have no dependence on asymptotics. And so one of the guiding questions for me and my group over the last 20 years has really been to say, you know, can we write down a formulation of holography which works in general? You know, which doesn't insist on having anti de Sitter asymptotics or some other specific kind of asymptotics. Can we, can we actually do something more generally than this? And of course, there are various ideas in this direction, the ideas of holographic screens, you know, pioneered by people like Raphael Buzo. But this has been a long-standing question on the table. So the basic, the basic sort of setup I have in mind in this talk is really the following. I have um, a space-time, and in my Penrose diagram over here, I haven't told you what happens on the right-hand side, so I'm not committing to what kind of asymptotics my space-time has. But I have a time-like surface in my space-time. I may typically have horizons, that's what's indicated in my picture, and what I want to do is associate some kind of quantum field theory on my, on my slice sigma, and say that this is going to be able to holographically describe the interior of the space-time, the region to the left of the red line, will be described by um, this quantum field theory. Now, as I said, this, this work goes back um, some time. Um, this particular talk will be based on a paper which came out in May. But actually, many of the ideas are picked up um, from papers that I wrote with Jeffrey Compare, Paul McFadden, Costa Skanderis in 2011-2012. Uh, there's a very closely related work which came out this week by Tom Hartman and his collaborators, and I encourage you to read that after this talk because they do some of the things I'm going to sort of tell you in the, in the conclusions one should do. And I should say, you know, Per Krauss and others in the room have thought about this um, problem specifically in the context of um, ADS3, three dimensions and two dimensional uh, quantum field theory. Okay, so I'm going to take a sort of very particular perspective to sort of, you know, tell you where my arguments come from. So, in this conference, we've seen a mixture between top-down and bottom-up um, considerations of holography. So, the, the, you know, the big advantage of a top-down model is that you've got a complete relationship between string theory and a given background and a specific quantum field theory. So, the archetypal example, ADS5 process 5 and n equals 4 would be Yang-Mills. Now, in a top-down model, you know, it's got a huge amount of information, and that's a plus, but it's often uh, also a difficulty. It's often very complex to work with. And so, as we see you know, throughout the talks in the conference, we often instead work, out, work with bottom-up models where we engineer the gravity the theory to capture the defining features that we want to get of the quantum field theory. And this was used to, you know, to considerable effect in ADS-CMT talks, ADS-QCD talks uh, during this conference. And so, you know, the basic setup I want to start with, which is going to, you know, give me a clue of what I should do um, to do holography at finite radius, is something which is very familiar and which was reviewed very nicely in Costas's talk and other talks in this conference. So, if I'm trying to de describe a relativistic RG flow, I'm going to have a UV fixed point. The minimum ingredients I'm going to need to describe this holographically are the graviton, and a scalar field, which is dual to my um, operator, which is driving the flow. So the minimal thing that I can do is write down an action which is in d plus one dimensions to describe a d-dimensional RG flow with gravity and a scalar. And my potential should be chosen that it has um, the action admits solutions which are ADS um, extrema so that I can actually have a UV fixed point. 
Now, if I want to sort of phrase this more precisely, you know, what, what do I actually do to, you know, how do I actually convince myself that, you know, the solutions I write down of my equations of motion are actually describing an RGU flow? And so again, we've seen, you know, used throughout this conference, we're, we're basically taking the information about the quantum field theory by taking the exact solutions of the equations of motion and then expanding them near the, the boundary of the space-time. So we take our metric and we write it in the Pfeffman-Graham um, coordinate system in the standard, in the standard way in the Pfeffman-Graham co coordinate system. And we will take our scalar field and we will also expand it out. And I should say, of course, you know, the dimension of the scalar field is related in the standard way, um, sorry, the dimension of the scalar operator is, is related in the standard way to the mass of the scalar field. Okay, and then what we do is we use the machinery of holographic renormalization to write down a relationship between the coefficients of the asymptotic expansion and the one-point functions in the conformal field theory. So in particular, um, the one-point function of the stress tensor is picked up in terms of the normalizable mode. There will also be terms involving um, derivatives of, of G0, the boundary metric. They don't play a role in the discussion here. And then one, one picks up the expectation value of the, the operator, um, the forming operator in terms, again, of the normalizable mode. And then one can show there's a relationship between them, a dilatation ward identity. And this dilatation ward identity is exactly what captures that we have a, a theory, a conformal theory, which has been deformed by a, so, a source for an operator O. So if this term wasn't here, you'd say that you've got a traceless, something which is a, a traceless, so it's a conformal theory. The tilde here is indicating there may be, of course, quantum conformal anomalies, which we can, we can carefully keep track of. And then this term here is telling us that we've actually switched on a source. This is the source for the deforming operator. And that was what we wanted to describe, right? That's, that's, that's what we do to describe our RG flow. Now, how does one actually go about this calculation? So this is, this is for the later discussion, it's, it's useless, useful to write down um, how you actually go about it. So what we're really working on is that near the boundary of the space-time, we can use a radial foliation. And it turns out to be more convenient for many purposes to use this coordinate system rather than the and Graham's coordinate system. So I switch from a row coordinate to an R coordinate. And now if I want to impose that the space-time is asymptotically ADS, then this, um, this metric here, it must tend to this metric G naught um, with a factor of e to 2R, and then there'll be subleading terms which are lower powers, lower exponential powers of R. Now, the conjugate variable to, to, to this metric gamma, so this is a d-dimensional metric, the conjugate momentum to gamma is what Brown and York from the relativity community wrote down many years ago. They call this a quasi-local stress tensor. So this is expressed in terms of the extrinsic curvature of the metric gamma in, embedded into your full d plus one dimensional space. But actually, the extrinsic curvature in this particular coordinate system is very simple. It's basically just the radial derivative of your metric gamma. Okay, so this is the Brown York um, quasi-local stress tensor. And here, you know, I haven't done holography yet. I just, I'm just writing down a quantity, which is, is perfectly well-defined for all values of the radius. Now, the problem is, you know, so our first guess in holography would be, well, you know, we, 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 we expect the metric to be capturing the information about the, the, the stress tensor in the quantum field theory. And so our first guess would have been, well, surely this quantity, curly T, that I've written down, is this just the, the, the stress tensor of the, the quantum field theory? But it's a straightforward enough calculation to show that this thing here, as you take the limit of R goes to infinity, you go to the boundary, this is not finite. And so you need to add boundary counterterms to the Einstein-Hilbert action. These render the on-shell action finite, and they give you additional contributions to the quasi-local stress tensor. So in, in addition to these terms involving the radial derivative of the metric, the first counterterm gives you a term which is proportional to the metric itself, and then there are further terms involving the curvature of that metric. So these, uh, this term was first written down by um, Per Krauss and Vijay, and then the sort of full gory details in all dimensions were analyzed by uh, Sebastian Haro and Costas and uh, Solodjukin um, shortly afterwards. Okay, and so this quantity, capital T, is manifestly finite as T goes to infinity, this expression is, is probably, you might not you, you, you know, always see it written in terms of the extrinsic curvature like this, but this expression is very familiar to, to many of you in this room because this is the expression that you use to calculate the stress tensor in um, the dual quantum field theory. So this has a finite limit, and that's where the expression I wrote down before came from. This is basically the, 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 the normalizable mode of the metric, 
And then there will, again, be terms involving the curvature of the background metric of the CFT G0 itself. And this expression satisfies, you know, the very nice identities. So in particular, if I do indeed keep track of, uh, of all those other contributions there, so not just DD, but all the other contributions involving the curvature of G0, you find that this thing satisfies the correct trace anomaly. For example, in two dimensions, you get the term involving proportional to the central charge. Now let's, let, let's sort of take this logic and think about what's going on when we work for finite radius hypersurface. So for a long time, there's been an intuition about what should be happening here. So our intuition is that radial evolution is related to renormalization group flow. And so what we should have done is, in some sense, you know, it integrated out a degrees of freedom. We should have an effective description, an effective field theory on this surface. In the context of fluid gravity, um, Shiraz Minwala and his collaborators you know, thought about you know, what the description would be at finite radius. Joe Porchinski and collaborators also thought about you know, this from the perspective of an RG flow and tried to argue about what the features of the, of the effect of quantum field theory would be. Very precise descriptions of um, the fluid at finite radius came in papers of Andy Strominger and the papers I already referred to um, with Jeffrey Comper and Paul and, and Costas. So there are many different approaches to this. But the, 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 one, the one kind of you know, thing that didn't come out was a very sharp definition of what the theory of finite radius would be, even just for ADS itself, ADS and, and finite temperature ADS, ADS black holes. Now, to get a clue about what the theory actually is, we can follow the logic that I've just been doing. So, um, what I was actually doing was writing my metric in, in um, a radial, in, I was foliating it in terms of constant radius um, hypersurfaces. And what I was really doing with my Einstein equations was, was just using a gauss cordazi form for the Einstein equations. And in particular, if you write your, your Einstein equations in gauss cordazi form, you find that one of your Einstein equations actually um, gives you a relationship between the, the extrinsic curvature of your, your, um, your um, slice and the intrinsic curvature of the slice, and then this term here is, is just the cosmological constant in the units I'm using. And now, if you use the relationship that I have before between the extrinsic curvature, you rewrite that in terms of a stress tensor. Again, I emphasize that at this point, I haven't taken the limit R goes to infinity, I'm just working at finite radius. So if I just take my dictionary, and, and I, replace my, I replace this by my stress tensor, I get, I get a relationship which is uh, somewhat thought-provoking. So on the left-hand side, I have the trace of the stress sensor. If this was zero, I would say that I was in a conformal field theory. I should say here, I've, I've actually uh, set the hypersurfaces now to be flat, so that term will drop out. The left-hand side, if that was zero, we'd say we're in a conformal field theory. So we were flat hypersurfaces, we wouldn't, the, the contribution of the conformal anomaly would be zero. So this is just, this is just saying that we have um, a conformal theory. The right-hand side um, is now quadratic in the stress tensor. And this looks very much akin to the relationship I was writing down before. So I said that when I had an, a, you know, a, a, a deformation by a scalar operator, I switched on a source for that operator, and I got a relationship that the trace of the stress tensor was just proportional to the deformation times uh, the source times the, the, the operator itself. And so what this, what this, this uh, expression asks me to do is identify this quantity here as something which is the deforming operator. So this is a scalar operator, but it's, it's something which is being written in terms of a quadratic combination of the stress tensor. Okay. So we can review, what I'm arguing is that we should try and view this relationship as a dilatation ward identity. We should view it as a relationship, you know, so lambda is gonna be proportional to the Newton constant here, and the deforming operator is this combination which is uh, quadratic in the stress tensor. Now it turns out, you know, as ever, when you, when you discover something kind of neat, that this particular combination of the stress tensor had been discussed in the literature before. In particular, if we work in D equals two, so that's correspondence between a three-dimensional bulk and a two-dimensional field theory, this particular operator is precisely the TT bar operator which Zamologikov had um, explored. And this, you know, this interpretation of this relation was proposed by the Princeton group, McGoff and, and et al, and very much um, pushed forward by Per Krauss and his collaborators earlier on in the year. 
Okay, so the idea is to really take this seriously as, you know, interpretation is to say that, you know, what is going on at finite radius is that one really has a conformal field theory which is deformed by this operator. Now, what was special about this operator in two dimensions? So, Zamolodikov um, very much emphasized that it has, this particular operator has a remarkable OPE structure. The operator can be identified as local, modulo derivatives of other local operators. You can use this as basically special features of being in two dimensions. You don't need conformal symmetry. You really just use, use uh, basic features of translational invariance and so on. And Samolodikov with uh, his collaborator Smirnov also explored the behavior of a conformal field theory when you made a deformation by this operator. So you take your conformal field theory and you make this deformation by, by this operator. And so in particular, what they, what they did was they looked at the spectrum of states and how the spectrum of states would depend on the, the deforming parameter lambda, which in our case, as I said, the, the, you know, the, the deforming parameter lambda is going to be associated with the, the radius of the surface on which one is considering. So what they do is they put their theory on a cylinder um, in a stationary state. We're now in a Euclidean theory, so we've gone from T to, to imaginary time tau. In a stationary state, we're on a, because we're on a cylinder, the parameter, the energy is just E over R. It's quantized in units of the radius of the cylinder. And simply the fact that one has a family of, of CFTs, the defining relation for the family of CFTs, that it's a conformal field theory deformed by this operator, gives you automatically a differential equation for the energy in terms of the parameter lambda, which is characterizing which, which member of the family of the CFTs you're in. So this is just, this is, is straightforward to write down. And you can manipulate this differential equation rather, rather straightforwardly. You can rewrite things in terms of dimensionless quantities. So lambda is a dimension-full quantity. Maybe I should have said that before. You know, so clearly, this coupling is going to have to be dimension-full because it's quadra it's the, the, the deforming operator is quadratic in the stress tensor. So it's going to have to be dimension-full. So we introduce a quantity alpha, which is dimensionless, and epsilon, which is a dimensionless energy. And then we get a, a kind of neat um, equation for our energy, which is just characterized in terms of this dimensionless parameter alpha. And that's the defining ODE for our energy spectrum. So you, def, you, know, you find a solution. Alpha equals 0 is going to correspond to lambda equals 0. That's the CFT itself. That's your boundary condition. And then epsilon and alpha is going to tell you how the energy changes as you, as you, as you scan through the family of, um, of quantum field theories. Now, what happens in general dimensions? So a number of authors had thought about um, what generalizations of the TT bar operator you could have in, in dimensions higher than two. Um, Cardi had proposed that, that one should actually look at an operator which is a determinant operator. Um, other people had suggested that you might like to look at analogs which were, which were quadratic in the stress tensor. But we have something which has been pulled out for us from the holographic analysis. We're told that that's the actual operator that we should look at. Now, some of the features that Zamolodikov highlighted don't go through. So in particular, this discussion of um, the, the, the nature of the OPE is no longer valid in dimensions higher than two. So the definition of the operator is somewhat more subtle. You need to actually take into account renormalization. So actually to define this, you really have to define it as a composite operator. Look at what happens as you, as you, as you bring two stress tensors on top of each other. But fortunately, those details are not required to repeat the calculation I just showed you is not required for the energy spectrum. It is needed if you want to ask what happens to the correlation functions as a function of the deforming parameter lambda, what happens to the entanglement entropy as a, as a function of the parameter lambda. But you don't need it to just run through the, the discussion of the energy spectrum. That works almost completely analogy, analogously to the, to the case I just showed you. So again, one is taking a conformal field theory and you're, you're deforming by this operator which is quadratic in the stress tensor. You put the theory on a cylinder of spatial volume Rd for you the dimensionless energy subject to the boundary condition that epsilon is zero is the CFT energy. Okay. So if our interpretation is correct, that holography, you know, the, 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 the theory at finite radius holographically is actually due to this theory, we should be able to produce this energy relation. And indeed, um, if we go back to holography, so now we, we, our uh, conjecture is that the theory inside this region on the left is characterized by this theory with the parameter lambda matching the radius of this circle, this, this, this surface. And so identifying the quasi-local stress tensor with the dual stress tensor, the ward identity is going to match by construction. That's going to work. 
And so our first test is, can we actually reproduce the energy spectrum? And that brings in the other Einstein equations. It's non-trivial, because to do this, this matching, we actually now have to look at, uh, at you know, what, are, what are the solutions that we have which, which have finite energy? Well, the exact solutions of the Einsteins that we have are just the static black brain solutions. So this is just your standards, you know, um, standard static black brain solution. Mu is just your, your, your usual, what would you, you would usually call your mass parameter. And now what you would do, so you, you know, if you were doing standard holography, you take this expression and you would use the expression for the renormalized stress tensor taught to us by you know, Vijay and Per and, and Costas and, and co. And you would read off that the stress tensor of the dual um, D plus one dimensional um, uh, quantum field theory was characterized in terms of this parameter mu. What we do here is we do exactly the same calculation, but we don't take the radius to infinity. We keep the radius finite. And then we can read off um, an expression for the stress tensor. And you can just, you know, back of the envelope calculation, convince yourself that as you do take rho to infinity, this will indeed pr precisely reproduce the standard energy of the black hole. And now if you look at this expression, um, you can convince yourself rather easily that you can just manipulate it. You can write it in terms of a dimensionless coupling again. And you can see that this, um, this expression here indeed satisfies exactly the same um, ODE that I wrote down uh, from the quantum field theory side, with the CFT energy indeed being the, the um, boundary condition. So the energy spectrum indeed matches. And again, this is a test which goes beyond the matching of the ward identities because we've used the full solution of the Einstein's equations to actually do this um, test. Okay, so comments on this. Um, it would be trivial to actually, I, I mean, for simplicity, I've just showed here the case of static brains. Obviously, you can just generalize this to boosted spinning brains. If you add into the bulk, you don't just look at pure gravity, but you start ad adding other fields. You add gauge fields and scalars and so on. This will modify the CFT deformation, and you also have to take into account that the values of the fields on the cutoff surface act as background couplings. And this deformation is, you know, on its own, not sufficient to describe what was happening. And indeed, this was already known in two dimensions. Um, Monica Galko, Adam Bozovsky discussed this in the case of Gagefield. Pear and his collaborators also discussed this in their paper. But what you can do here you know, with, with this methodology is systematically work out what's going on at finite radius by analyzing the gauss cordazi equations of whatever your bulk um, action is. So you add your gauge fields, you add your scalars. You can systematically work out what's, what's going on on the other side. So conclusions and outlook. The idea is that um, this deformation is actually going to describe for you the holographic theory, which is dual to finite radius um, anti de Sitter. It's a natural generalization of the D equals 2 proposal. It passes preliminary checks. The ward identity works by construction. The energy relations work trivially because you have to use the black hole solutions. You can do more detailed checks. There you have to actually think about how you're going to define the renormalized operator. Um, you can essentially do this in conformal perturbation, and some of this is done in um, Tom Hartman's paper. Some, some other checks are actually in, in work, which is still in progress of myself and a collaborator. This particular pro pro proposal is rather interesting. Um, it can easily be extended beyond ADS asymptotics. So, you, you know, the basic proposal is that one is using really um, a radial Hamiltonian formulation and using the gauss cordazi relation to understand what the family of theories are. In fact, six or seven years ago, when we were discussing the, the fluid gravity correspondence for Ricci flat space times, we really almost came, we said something very similar. We had a proposal for the dual theory there, which was, was, was based on, on exactly this methodology. So where the sort of thing in the tail is, um, and why you know, the, the, the main uh, uh, obstruction in going uh, beyond cases where you actually know um, the UV behavior, is that the UV behavior was implicitly used in fixing the relation, in fixing the integration constants, in fixing the relationship between our um, stress tensor in the, in the quantum field theory and our brown York stress tensor. So in particular, we did need to use the counterterms um, of um, ADS-CFT in our definition. Um, but subject to that, one could actually consider exploring this proposal beyond ADS asymptotics. And thus, it looks interesting as a way to sort of push forward the question that I raised at the beginning. You know, can we actually start doing holography at finite radius? 
We used it in quantum field theory to working with effective field theories. We don't you know, think for many questions, we actually need to know the full UV behavior. So should we be able to do the same in holography? And this looks a likely way to do it. I'll stop there. I think from Pear. I think from Pear. I think that there, sh there will certainly be corrections of water, absolutely. So the corrections, so you know, if we, if we thought about this from the holographic side, we would be adding higher derivative terms into gravity, that would be our way of doing it. And as we add those in, those would modify the gauss cadazi relation, and you could systematically construct the corrections to that. Yes. Yeah. Further questions? Okay, I don't see anything, but uh, also probably <laughs> people are getting a little exhausted. I can imagine. But uh, thank you very much for this part of your talk. Uh, All right, and we're going to move on still with Marika, and because she is going to give us a summary of our conference. So, yeah. Thank you. So thank you. So thank you to Johanna for asking me to do this because it made me concentrate on all the talks and put them in perspective. I have to say, I mean, Johanna and I were at Cambridge together, and I feel at this point like the survivor of a Trinity College ball, right? It's, 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 <laughs> it, they go on all night, and you feel it's, it's a long week. Okay, so um, I'm going to sort of, you know, give a brief summary of what's, what we've done and where I see the sort of big questions as being. So um, Carlos Nunes actually already gave a summary. So he said for him, you know, the talks in this conference fall into two basic categories. You use gravity to, to learn about strongly interacting field theories, and we use our knowledge of quantum field theory to explore string theory and quantum gravity. And one thing for the older members of the audience, I don't think that 21 years ago when Mulder Senna's paper came out, one would have anticipated the number of implications and applications of that paper, and how much new implications and new applications come forth in, in sort of almost every year and every conference. So what I think that, you know, Carlos's uh, description is broadly correct. I've actually done a, a, you know, my categorization is a little bit more fine than this. So I'm going to sort of start with, again, a sort of a little bit of history because many of the people in the audience are younger. So if you go back to 97, as Costa sort of almost reviewed in his talk, one of the first things that people did immediately after ADS-CFT came along was really try and find all instances of ADS solutions in supergravity and try and work out what the CFT duals would be. And then, of course, the next thing that people said from very much from a particle physics perspective is, well, of course, we want to break that conformal symmetry. We want to have things which are closer to QCD. So we're going to try and find exact solutions with renormalization group flows. This is both with explicit symmetry and spontaneous symmetry. And 21 years later, one of the very striking things is that we actually still have rather few exact solutions exhibiting all the features that we would like from top-down models. So Klebanov Strasler, again, this is another paper where when Igor and, and Matt Strasler wrote this, I don't think they would have anticipated the amount that this was actually used, because they would have thought that this was one step on the way, and other, you know, other solutions which were, would be found um, exhibiting these features. So we've seen in this conference, you know, this, this program is still very much ongoing. So we had a nice talk today from Michael Gutperler talking about supergravity solutions dual to five-dimensional superconformal field theories. And these were something which clearly do not jump out at you as sort of very simple solutions. You have to use rather more sophisticated techniques to access them. You know, this gives you very interesting um, information because 5D CFTs are not something that you can construct, you know, with, with simple perturbative models. We saw more, you know, um, systematic ways of constructing RG flows in Costas's talk. Um, the n equals one star theories. Again, when the Polchinski-Strasler paper came out, you know, there was a flood of interest in this. As a, a, again, 
a possibility of, of, of trying to get things which are more realistic, more close to QCD. Um, and now, okay, one seems to have, you know, a way of systematically constructing such solutions. We've also seen um, discussion of using knowledge of dual CFTs to actually um, obtain uh, features of, of geometries. So that was very much a feature of Carlos Nunes' talks and also in, in Nastasi's talk. And then we've seen more exotic supergravity solutions, and I'll come back to those a bit later. The Suzy Q and Boomerang Algae Flows. I think Jerome, I think he's not here, he wins the prize for you know, naming his solutions very well. You know, for those young people in the audience, give a good name to your solutions. It's, uh, you know, it, it, it sort of sticks, Q lattices and so on. So what have we learned from this? So one thing is that, you know, so several pieces of this progress really build on a long program of work within the, 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 the community that finds supergravity solutions. So in particular, um, it's the exploitation of G structures and generalized geometry. So it, I should say, in, 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 I think really in both of those two um, constructions, we're really building on a whole body of work. And actually, I anticipated, I think, the question which was gonna come at the end of the last talk, because you know, it's very natural to sort of think that double field theory plays a role here, and, and we should be able to exploit it more. So open questions, can, I mean, Costas raised one, you know, this technology, can you use it to reconstruct other supersymmetric RG flows? Another issue which has been raised several times, um, you know, people who have grown up computing entanglement entropy, you can compute other things too, it is allowed. So you can compute the spectra, you can compute correlation functions. We had, you know, really lovely talk from, from Per Krauss, you know, talking about, you know, constructing, um, looking at self-energy and using Wilson loops. There are many other things you can calculate. There's a huge amount of unexploited information when you have these exact uh, geometries. Um, there was a very nice talk in one of the parallel sessions by Paul Firiadis, which was looking at the spectrum for ADS2 cross S2. I was so surprised that this wasn't known. Once you have this, you can actually do a lot. You can look at the modes on the sphere. There's just a lot more information. Numerical relativity is coming in, into its own. We haven't heard so many talks in this, in this particular meeting, but it's clear that actually, you know, if we were really serious about answering some of these questions, we have to develop numerical relativity techniques. And as somebody who lives in a, a numerical relativity group, I would emphasize that the problems that we're solving are often not the problems that the numerical relativity community has been solving. So we can learn from them, but we also have to develop our own techniques. We're often, for example, interested in, in, in the first pass at finding solutions which are just static, characterizing different phases of the system. Your relativists would always be looking at things which are time dependent, you know, black hole collisions and so on. So, you know, numerical relativity, developing the techniques is an important thing. Testing holographic duality. So if you were in a conference 20 years ago, the focus would have been on testing it. Most of us have now decided, well, we just believe in it, right? But, but you know, it's still important. You learn a lot from testing. So, it, it, you know, integrability established n equals four super young mills duality at the planar level, I think, you know, beyond dispute. But now people want to go beyond conformality. So we heard a nice discussion from Charlotte Christiansen about integrability in the context of defect conformal field theories. And I think this is very interesting, not just from the perspective of testing it, but also understanding how integrability plays out in more complicated setups. And defect conformal field theories, of course, were used in many other contexts in this conference as you know, actual um, applications of ADS-CFT. There's still signs of more unexploited you know, solubility, solvability even, and integral structure. I mean, there were hints of this in various talks, um, you know, of, of results which look like they should have a nice way of resumming that we saw in Pear's talk, you know, things where that there seem to be more structure that we have to find. And of course, you know, one of, one of the things which, which we are you know, always eager is, is to actually have new glasses of duality. Again, from a history perspective, initially the perspective was very much from a particle physics. You know, it was, well, you're modeling CFT, N equals four super Yang meals. Can you do something which is related to QCD? So people were looking at holographic descriptions of CFTs and relativistic RG flows. You know, I remember talking to Ed Witten after Costas and I wrote a paper in 2002 where we were looking at brains in ADS, which would actually break the um, four-dimensional translational symmetry. And you know, Ed was like, why would you want to do that? And you know, from 2008 and even before then, 
it was kind of obvious that this was a natural thing to do if you were actually going to look at applications of ADS-CFT. So from 2008, I, I picked that particular year because that's the year in which people said, well, why are we sticking to just relativistic theories? But you know, in, in, in addition, you know, we, it became clear that looking at theories which had defects was going to be interesting for condensed matter systems. And so in this meeting, we've, we're still exploring new classes of, of, of dualities. So Niels Obers, I would, you know, one of the take-home messages I would take there is he's really very much emphasizing that we need to develop our non-relativistic gravity. That's been floating around for some time, but for a lot of the modeling of non-relativistic quantum field theory holographically has been using relativistic gravity. For somewhat obvious reasons, because if we're in non-relativistic gravity, it's hard to understand how black holes and finite temperature works. But that's, that's a direction which you know, he and his group are pursuing. Of course, in, in, in the context of modeling um, momentum dissipation, through many of the talks, we see you know, breaking translational invariants, um, you know, many different mechanisms are now known for doing it. As I mentioned several times, we, we see an importance of boundary uh, CFT, defect CFT. And we even have you know, something, I mean, piadic string theory has had a life in string theory. And now piadic theories, you know, Steve Gubbs sort of suggests that this is something we should look at because you can realize them in the lab. And then the question is, can you say anything about these holographically that you couldn't do you know, just with quantum field theory? It's certainly an interesting arena to play with. And it's an arena I think that mathematicians might be interested in. The piadic reconstruction is something they would be interested in. OK, of course, you know, there are dualities of dualities as well. So Andreas Karch's talk, he was talking about three-dimensional Chan Simons dualities, so dualities between two quantum field theories. But then seeing how you could actually see these dualities holographically. So this picture, I should say, is, is, is taken from one of Karch's um, recent papers with Christian Jensen. This is one where the realization with, with, is with probe brains. And one can see, you know, holography, this is going to give interesting dualities between holography, holographic theories. Um, there's still, you know, these are very new dualities. And so actually compiling evidence for the 3D Chan Simons dualities is interesting. Maybe some of the evidence that you want to get would be easier to get with holographic models. There was only one talk about this in this conference, but it's clearly, an, you know, an exploding interest in, 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 in the U.S. at the moment. I find it interesting. So earlier in, earlier this summer, I was at String Phenomenology, which was very much dominated by the swamp land and the weak gravity conjecture. So for those who don't know it, of course, the, the, the swamp land is the statement, you know, the discussion pioneered by Auguri and Waffer, saying that many of the effective field theories that, that you can write down are some, simply things which cannot come out of string theory. So many of your effective field theories are doomed to be in the so-called swamp land. It seems to me that you know, coming from one conference to another, we're almost switching it the other way around. We have now a huge landscape of consistent dualities. You know, many of them are already top-down string theory you know, dualities. And actually, we're looking for new real-world applications. And so it's, it's you know, still interesting to sort of think about what, what new classes of applications we could have. The picture here, by the way, is meant to be, this is um, the landscape of string vacua. And so, you know, if your theory is not on this landscape, then it's in, it, living in the swap land. Okay, so four main classes of applications I would pick out in this conference. So particle physics, this was the earliest applications of ADS-CFT. Enormous amount of discussion of condensed matter physics. Fluids, which I would put in a, in a separate category, of course, a related category um, to, the, to the first two, but, you know, very much a, an emphasis on transport and turbulence, um, thermalization. And I don't think we usually think of this as an application, but actually the perspectives that we get on quantum information may indeed turn out to be something which can be applied and we, we can you know, have fruitful interaction with the quantum information community. So in particle physics discussions we had in the, in, in the main talks, in the plenary talks, um, Nick Evans gave a very nice review about holographic models, holographic models for mesons, trying to get the meson spectra and this is sort of taking input from various types of top-down models, putting them all into the same model, trying to get the right features. But Kobe, after this, you know, emphasized that perhaps we should not really expect to do this just in a, in a gravity model. You know, we should actually affect, expect to need to have um, string effects. I should say, with Kobe's talk, um, I would very much like to, to take the same slides and have three hours to listen to all of it. 
because I think it's so interesting, all the different things. Um, but you know, this is this is a, you know a, a community which is, is is maturing, and which you know one can actually. I think the thing that's nice is that sort of taking the features and understanding what features you need in your holographic model to actually uh, pick up the features of data. Um, we heard about other aspects of, of QCD. So the picture on the left is indicating the discussion of Pomerons from Miguel Costa. A number of the, the um, uh, talks we've heard here and also some of the posters are really exploring phases of QCD. So the quark gluon plasma, the, one of the first applications of ADS-CFT, but also you know, high density QCD, you know, the, the regions, uh, regions in the phase space of QCD where holographic models may actually be able to provide useful guides, useful input. From the condensed matter side, I, I, I was kind of trying to steal pictures for all of these, but I, I, I kind of ran out of, you know, ran out of space almost. We've heard holographic models for superconductors, intertwined order, cuprates, bad metals, semi-metals, multi-insulates, charge density waves, and I'm sure I've missed more. So a large number of talks in the conference talking about these different things. It's an indication of the, the general superconducting diagram. This is um, you know, semi-metal um, near a quantum uh, critical point. And what we see is, again, this is, this is where we've got a huge landscape of possible models. I should say many of the models here are really bottom-up models, so it is an open question how much all of these can be embedded as, as really fully consistent top-down models. But we have a, a, a whole landscape of these um, to actually explore these phases. Quantum chaos, um, a huge topic over the last couple of years, the relationship between black holes and chaos. Um, we've heard very much S about SYK as a toy model um, and getting new insights into quantum chaos using SYK. And we've also sort of understood you know, how um, chaos in holographic models comes out of hydrodynamics, why it is that you know, one gets a universal answer in, in, in all theories with an Einstein gravity description. Now, I should say here, I mean, one of Sashdev's original motivations for thinking that SYK had something to do with black holes was that they shared, they shared the same Lyapunov exponent. Now we know that SYK is not dual to an Einstein gravity theory. We know that because we know the SYK spectrum doesn't have a gap. It has um, e rather evenly spaced modes. We should not expect all the features to be captured by Einstein gravity. And there's a kind of conceptual question here. You know, when can, get, when, when can you get maximal chaos but not have a gravity description? You know, how are these things intertwined uh, with each other? There's still a very big question in these kinds of applications of ADS-CFT, and it's, it's a criticism, I think, that has been made many times over the years. String theory clearly provides a landscape of strongly interacting phases, but we know that we're doing this at large n. Um, typically, implicitly in our system, we do have an underlying supersymmetry, so we have bosons and fermions floating around in our system. So if we're describing a condensed matter uh, system where the dominant physics really seems to be that of, say, fermions, the fact we have bosons worry, you know, floating around should worry us, we have intuitive arguments. I sort of uh, highlighted earlier, you know, Nick Evans is using intuitive arguments to argue why specific features of the holographic models are correct and how to put them together. But it's a question for, I think, for, for everyone, for all of us who work in this kind of modeling, to sort of say, well, can we sharpen those arguments more? Can we explain what is going to be universal and what is not going to be universal? Um, if we really want to kind of make an impact on, on communities around us, I think we have to do that. Now, fluid gravity relations. I mean, it's a beautiful, beautiful topic which has evolved really over the last 10 years. And so we've heard a number of talks in, in this meeting. Um, thermalization, hydrodynamics, turbulence, understanding holographic descriptions, understanding how you can get intuition from holographic models. Rather, rather, you know, beautifully, there's also um, measurable effects. So, you know, one, one gets intuition from holographic models, but one, one can then go in and look at these things just, just entirely from a quantum field theory perspective. And we see that some of the anomalies I've discussed actually have physical implications. So we have collaborations, Carl Landstein, between, you know, uh, string theorists and condensed matter uh, physicists, experimentalists, exploring these things in vile semi-metals. We haven't discussed them in this, in this particular meeting, but this whole kind of work has led to new, um, new it, uh, results in fluid mechanics. So you'd almost think that there's nothing new you can actually do in fluid me mechanics. 
But we see that there are rather elegant new formulations coming out for hydrodynamics, you know, elegant um, mathematical <laughs> constructions. And we also see an increasing attempts to actually construct um, action principles for dissipative fluids. Um, again, using, using some of the insights that came from holography. Um, and these are things which could have impact beyond, I think, our own community. So quantum information, I think the talks here broadly divide into two categories. So 2006, Ryu Takenagi wrote down the entanglement entropy proposal. You know, it was, I guess, explored for some years before it was proven. Now it's proven. And so, you know, there's still an enormous amount of interest in using entanglement entropy, computing the areas of minimal surfaces to access entanglement entropy. And in this meeting, we've heard quite a lot about complexity. Two proposals for computing this holographically, I show here just one, the action of the Wheeler-DeWitt patch. So what are, we, what are people doing in holographic entanglement entropy? So, you know, a couple of years ago, people said, you know, there was almost a conclusion at this point of, well, we understand what's going on in conformal field theories, we understand how it works holographically. You know, what we need to do now is generalize to new shapes, we need to go away from symmetric shape regions, and we need to apply it to new theories. And I think that's a broad summary of what was done by Rob Lee and, and Eric Tony. This is a picture from Eric Tony's talk. I think Eric had by far the, the most beautiful sort of visualizations of his surfaces. So they were both exploring what happens when you look at entanglement entropy in new classes of theories, um, uh, new shape regions, and there are very deep connections with mathematics, you know, understanding uh, relations with Wilmore functionals, maybe construction of higher functionals, uh, Wilmore functionals, and so on and so forth, which I think the maths community is interested in. Of course, the other interest people have had in, in holographic entanglement entropy is how this relates to space-time reconstruction. And we heard a number of talks about that and about the general properties of the holographic in, in entanglement ent entropy. And then in, in one of the, the, the final talks today, we, we um, learned about how you we use entanglement entropy to you know, understand more about the mysterious theory of the M5 brain and self-dual uh, strings. So it's sort of, I think, representative of the kinds of directions that people take the entanglement entropy into. But complexity was, if you count by talks, one of the most popular themes of this particular conference. And again, you know, using, using Carlos Nunes' binary classification, I would, I would roughly divide these talks into defining complexity, worrying about the definitions that we have, and then exploring complexity, particularly holographically, using the working definitions that there actually are, seeing what you can actually do with this and, and what you can, can learn for it. So the problem with, you know, for me, for, for complexity right now, is that the definitions on both sides have a lot of subtleties. So what is holographic complexity? There are two distinct proposals. One is the action of a Wheeler-DeWitt patch. The other is a volume. There seem to be ambiguities in these definitions. There is no derivation from the defining relation of holography I think those are the two big questions that people you know, are working on and uh, thinking about. I mean, Laris's talk was very much you know, exploring these definitions and, and seeing how this would you know, come in, 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 in different models. Um, of course, you know, going back in time, Ryu, Taki, and Agi in 2006, they had um, a proposal. It passed various checks, but they couldn't make a proof. It was much later that there were proofs, first by Cassini, Herta, and Myers for particular shape entangling regions. And then a general argument coming from um, Lefkowitz and Marasena, which was really based from the defining relation of holography. For me, the defining relation of holography would be you know, the matching of, of, of um, partition functions. So it's, it's using the on-shell action of, of, of gravity and understanding where this would come from, from this. And I don't think so far we, we have a derivation. But similarly, on the other hand, you know, complexity in a quantum field theory, as we've heard, is somewhat difficult to define. So if you go to a quantum information theory textbook, you will find complexity in, perhaps in the later chapters, but it's actually defined for finite numbers of qubits, and it's defined in a language which is very far from quantum field theory and from holography, so you're using either the language of qubits, the language of, 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 of operations on those qubits. So we've heard in a number of talks the difficulties and challenges of defining complexity in um, quantum field theories. We heard um, you know, approaches to doing this in free field theories. We heard you know, an axiomatic type definition. And I think this is a very active area of research. For me, one of the, the fundamental questions, and maybe I missed, maybe it was encoded in people's, people's talks, but you know, all the definitions of complexity seem to want a reference state 
and a reference basis for the gates which, which take you from one state to another. And there's a question of how that information would be encoded in any holographic definition of complexity. Those, those two pieces of information seem to be missing. The picture on the left is, is, is from Kian Young's um, recent paper, where again, it indicates that one needs a sort of a basis of gates, a basis of a reference, a basis of states and a reference state. So, of course, one of the interests of entanglement and, 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 and complexity is really understanding the big question of space-time emergence. So this is emergence of quantum gravity from quantum field theory, ultimately to explain the properties of black holes, to explain how you resolve singularities, not just in black holes, but at the beginning of the universe in, in cosmology. Um, it's not a topic that we've heard so much about in this specific meeting, but it is very much an application, I think, of, of gauge gravity duality. So there are several, in a sense, space-time reconstruction is, 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 is used for several different procedures to reconstruct the bulk. So for those of you, the younger people in the audience, you're probably the most familiar with this, this kind of picture over here. So this is a picture where we um, give you um, the entanglement of regions. So this is, this is you know, meant to be a two plus one dimensional bulk. And we give you the entanglement of, of uh, particular regions in the boundary theory. And you use this to construct a differential entropy and then reconstruct a whole. And you know, similarly, one can use, I mean, this is, this is the, the so-called holography, but one can similarly use entanglement entropy to try and reconstruct the bulk. But if you go back 15 years earlier, we understood much earlier in ADS-50, as I, as I used in my own talk, the explicit reconstruction of space-time near the boundary from the quantum field theory data. So I was saying it the other way around, but if I give you the one-point function of your stress tensor and other operators, then one, one uses the reconstruction, you know, the asymptotic solution of the equations of motion to reconstruct the, the region near the boundary. One gets it as, as, as an expansion, and so that's why I show that it's, the expansion only holds in a finite neighborhood of the boundary. In principle, it contains all the information of the interior, but that requires resumming the series. So both of these things can be viewed as space-time reconstruction. So some of the talks in this meeting, including my own, sort of talk about you know, generalizations of the space-time reconstruction for ADS. Um, Yegor Korovin talked about you know, really trying to understand the relationship between asymptotic data and quantum field theory data in Ricci flat space times. But we've heard in other talks, um, taking the, the quantum field theory data, in particular from SYK, Instrument NASA's talk, and trying to understand rewriting the, the, the solution of SYK in a way that reconstructs an extra dimension. But their methodology invokes radon transforms. These arose previously, actually, in, in, in various discussions of entanglement entropy, particularly the work of, of Jan de Boer and co and Hiroshi Aguri. I think it's interesting to sort of see whether these two approaches are related and also actually understand the connections of, of different ways of reconstructing um, the bulk. So if I go over here, you know, in this method, you're taking the, the quantum field theory data you're using is one point functions of local operators. Over here, the information you're using is entanglement entropy or equivalently Wilson line. So it's, it's, it's a certain amount of, it's non-local information. And the relationship between these reconstructions is not well understood. Now, we've also talked about going beyond Einstein gravity. Actually, for those who heard Andreas Karch's uh, after dinner speech, you know, he emphasized, you know, we should, you know, at some point we're going to have to bite the bullet and actually do string theory in, in ADS. Well, as a first step towards that, we're doing string theory in a special limit. We're doing it, you were looking at higher spin theories, which can be viewed as a tensionless limit. So we had a nice review talk by Castro talking about three-dimensional higher spin theories because they're very much an educational playground. You get aspects of black holes, and you know, we had a lot about um, what you can learn about those. But of course, there are very, you know, very many technical challenges in this subject, um, particularly as you go up in dimensions. So we heard about characters of representations, interactions, correlation functions. We heard about loop behavior. And of course, in dimensions higher than, um, than three, one of the issues in higher spin theories, and perhaps the longest standing big issue, is the issue of finding non-trivial solutions, describing black holes. So the lessons we learn with three-dimensional higher spin theories are really fascinating, but how could we lift those to dimensions higher than four? And then eventually bite the bullet. I mean, there is, of course, work in the pure spinner community of trying to do string theory in ADS-5 backgrounds. It kind of, you know, not many people work on this, so it goes kind of slowly. 
but ultimately we would like to do this too. So black holes, of course, black holes are ubiquitous through the talks because they're there whenever we're discussing thermalization, hydrodynamics, holographic phases. But you know, we've also um, you know, seen talks which were really focused on black holes. So Finn was talking about N attractors, is that right? Sorry, I thought you would talk about black hole microstate counting when I wrote this. You, you are at the end, but it was mostly about N, N attractors. We heard about low dimensional black holes as controllable models, both in um, um, Castro's talk in, in three dimensional higher spins and, and, and Laris's talk in, in uh, two dimensional you know, reductions of, of four dimensional black holes. And of course, there's a huge amount of work that goes on into you know, constructing explicit solutions. So there was a talk in the parallel session but you know, that's, that's something which my uh, colleagues in Southampton, people like Oscar Diaz, work a lot on. They work on constructing explicit solutions, looking at their stability and so on. So here my astronaut is sort of gazing at the features of the black hole. One of the things we haven't talked about in this conference, um, which I think also fits very naturally with engaged gravity duality, is you know, ultimately, you know, immediately after ADS-CFT came along, Anyone who thought that there was information loss in black holes switched opinions. So even Stephen Hawking, I, I'm not sure when he, you know, when he decided in private and when he did publicly, but certainly very early on, he was happy to admit in private that you know, information was not lost in black holes. But 21 years later, we are still asking questions. We have still not resolved the fundamental questions. So in particular, what does holography tell us about the experience of an observer going into a black hole? Is this even a sensible question? People do try and ask this, but is it sensible? How do we recover information from black holes? So we've got you know, some understanding of the toy models in three dimensions, but we haven't nailed this completely. We had one talk about soft hair um, by Gordon Semenov. Is this relevant to black hole physics? So in, in the UK uh, journalism community, um, there's, a, there's a joke that whenever you put a, a, a something with a question mark, the answer is actually no, um, which in this case represents my opinion. I think soft hair is very interesting, but you can formulate black holes in terms of hard quantities. It's, it's probably not relevant to that, but very interesting for other reasons. And all of these things are things we would ultimately like to get from gauge gravity duality, and of course people do work on. So just to conclude, there are many exciting directions of research for the next edition of Gauge Gravity Duality, which we hope to have in, in two years' time. So many thanks to Johanna, Rene, and others. Martin also, I know, in the organization and their group for hosting us. And I believe at this point we want to thank the team who've been organizing. So Johanna has a gift for them. Thanks a lot, Maureen.